wizard is never late, nor is he early. He arrives precisely when he means to. Uh, good evening, everybody. Up, oh, I've got to do uh, one thing real quick. Um, Give me one second. I've got to go and get my uh, plug and we don't want to lose power. guys sorry about that uh hair of a delay there uh it remember there's always a lag on these and bill you could be a little bit nicer so it's always a uh, be nice be nice to people so anyway how is everybody tonight um i guess our topic tonight is the the last of the major wind instruments and we're talking Tubas, tubas and flugelhorns. Okay, Bill, you are not being nice. So you're going to be silenced. So anyway, yeah, sorry to have to deal with uh, people who aren't very nice already starting out. That's never good, never fun. Uh, but anyway, yeah, so tonight we are going to uh, wrap up uh, talking about the woodwinds and brass and talk about uh, tubas. And tubas are a much larger instrument family than most people realize. So... Um, yeah, so first off, I will field any kind of questions you guys have before we kind of go into the history. And I've got an interesting uh, document here um, to, to kind of back up some of the history stuff. But anyway, yeah. And remember, as always, there's a 30-second delay on the timing, and I think that's just something that's built into YouTube. And I've switched. I'm not, I don't have coffee tonight. It's so cold, I've switched to hot chocolate. Yep, that's hot. All right. So if I don't have any uh, questions to start out with, let's go ahead and then define what a, uh, a tuba is. So a couple weeks ago when we talked about uh, sax horns uh, with the cornets, uh, we did talk a lo lot about uh, tubas because there is some overlap there. Properly defined, a tuba is a completely or nearly completely conical bore brass instrument with a deep cup mouthpiece. Because of these characteristics, uh, members of the tuba family are capable of easily playing the fundamental pitch, the, the pedal tone. Um, though there are a couple tubas where it's actually more difficult. Um, the largest size of the tuba, it becomes more difficult to do that simply be not because of the instrument because human lips can't uh, vibrate that slowly but this means that there are several instruments that fit into the category of tubas so everything that has the name tuba on it is of course a tuba that's our bass tubas and contrabass tubas uh, bass tubas are in e flat and f contrabass tubas are in uh, b flat and c we also have tenor tubas, and the most uh, well-known tenor tuba is the euphonium, but there's also the German-style uh, baritone, uh, which is not to be confused with the baritone horn, um, is a cornet like a mixture of a trumpet and a flugelhorn. In a simplistic way, helicopter, yes, 
in a much more real world sense, no. The Cornet really is its own family. It there are elements of flugel. Um, there are elements of trumpet in there. Has there ever been an instance of a section of flugel horns being used in an orchestral setting? Yes. Um, most often it is going to be um, a single solo flugelhorn. Uh, the two great examples of this are Mahler's Third Symphony. There's an offstage uh, part that in early editions is marked flugelhorn. In later editions it's marked posthorn. What the player ultimately decides to play is typically a player's choice. Uh, I prefer the flugelhorn sound here. Um, but if it, someone comes out with an actual valve post horn, no problem there. I don't like it when it's done on trumpet because it's, it's not a trumpet solo. The other really well-known orchestral, uh, flugelhorn solo is from Rafe von Williams Symphony Number no. 9. And, um, I highly, highly recommend you go listen to von Williams Symphony 9. It is just this incredible masterwork. I... Studied it quite a bit for, uh, <laughs> it was kind of the inspiration for the final movement of uh, my Symphony 4 I'm working on now. Um, but as far as a flugelhorn, there are a couple cases. Uh, the earliest that I know of is from Gustav Mahler's early cantata Das Klagende Lied, which means the Songs of Sorrow or the Sorrowful Songs. It's uh, basically settings of fairy tales and so it's one of uh Mahler's earliest works and there are there is a section of offstage flugelhorns there's a couple different versions of the piece uh and a lot of times they will be done on um trumpets but he really wanted them on flugels the other composer who's bringing in sections of flugelhorns is Otterino Respighi and Respighi is going to use flugelhorns in two of his pieces. So we have the Pines of Rome, which has a section of flicorni, or flicorno, or fliscorn, um, that are the offstage brass. So it's two uh, flicorno, or buccine, which he also used, uh, soprano, which are soprano flugelhorns, and then tenor, which are baritone horns, and then basses, which are euphoniums. So there's two flugelhorns there. But in the Feste Roman, the opening theme of Feste Roman uh, by Respighi, is on three flugelhorns. But I can guarantee you right now there is not a performance out there that does that on flugel, and they do it all on trumpets because it's more power. But... Respighi wrote Buccine and then Flicorno. I mean, just double down said, I want this on flugelhorn. And it's supposed to be these uh, calling bugles. So uh, those are the pieces right off the top of my head that I can think of that um, call for a section of flugelhorns. Um... All right. Let me get back to that. Uh, sorry, I just got a, um, the, um, I, I just got a message from Richard Bobo. I'll, I'll read that later. Um, hi there. Got to catch one of these live. What's your opinion on piston top and front versus valve tubas? I have no opinion whatsoever as a composer. I am, remember, I'm, I'm, I'm primarily a composer. What valve system the player uses is not up to me. Um, it, different players have different opinions. I am just happy if they make a distinction between using a bass tuba and a contrabass tuba. Past that, don't care. Um, it's you, you're not you're not going to make that kind of nitpicky decision on exactly what brand of instrument a player uses with anything else. But since uh, what I get these questions about flugelhorn, um, is the flugelhorn a tuba? And of course, I think we're pretty much on the side that yes, flugelhorns are indeed members of the tuba family. 
Um, and to illustrate that point, I've got the, this is the, the document I have, and this is only just the first few pages. This is an early uh, band piece, uh, well, early, I don't know the date on it, and I cannot find a date. I have searched, um, but uh, this is the March Symphonique of Wilhelm Wieprecht. Wieprecht is the father of the tuba. Uh, Wieprecht and Moritz together invented the bass tuba. And so we can take uh, Wieprecht on his word as to what a tuba is. This is one of his pieces. And so let me just read down the instrumentation here. It's a little hard to read because it's in an older German script, but I will uh, do my best. Uh, flutes. Um, and I, th yes, he, his flutes and piccolo are in D flat. Um, oboes. And then right after the oboes, and this is where the score gets very weird. Soprano tuba in B flat. Uh, alto tuba in E flat, tenor tuba in B flat. So right off the bat, he is calling for soprano tuba, alto tuba, and tenor tuba. I do not know a single other score that calls for soprano tuba, but here it is in this March Symphonique by Wilhelm Wieprecht. And so what do we make of this? Um... I, uh, well, let's see what else we have in here. The next thing down is bald horn. That's just regular uh, horn. Kleine clarinet. So that's an A flat clarinet. The middle clarinet is the E flat clarinet. But what we think of as a small, he calls the middle. And then the big clarinet in B flat. Bassoon. And then here's a really cool one in here. Bathophone. This is the earliest score out there that calls for a contrabass clarinet that the bathophone again um invented by Vprecht, who also invented the tuba is a contrabass clarinet and it says in the side um contrabassoon um serpent and there might be something else and then i've got four trumpets uh Zug Pasaunin. So Zug Pasaunin means slide trombone. And he's asking for tenor and bass slide trombones. And then we've got bass tuba down here. So up at the top of the score, soprano, also tenor tuba. Down at the bottom, um, bass tuba. Um, and then drums. And then he, here's something very odd. I've got another section down here, soprano tuba. And then Clappenhorn, uh, a keyed bugle in C, alto tuba, tenor tuba, baritone tuba, more trumpets, and more bass tubas. So, Vprecht is very much thinking along um, uh, these big family lines, and his flugelhorns are just soprano tubas to him. I had a friend tell me that a B-flat tuba is a contrabass flugelhorn. He's not wrong, but you could also tell him that a flugelhorn is a soprano tuba, and that's not wrong either. So, think of it this way. As we come from the top down, we call them flugelhorns. As we go from the bottom up, we call them tubas. Um, so, case in point, the instrument in C, pitched a step above the euphonium, that is used in Spanish bands is typically called a bass flugelhorn. Uh, why does the British brass band only feature one flugelhorn versus all the other sections featuring multiple players? Um, mm, I don't know. It, it has to do with tradition, uh, Braden. If um, the counterpoint that is the uh, Dutch... Um, Fanfare Orchest. Uh, the Fanfare Orchest is kind of like the brass band with added saxophones. But instead of a section of uh, 
cornets, we have a large section of flugelhorns. So it's going to be a very, very different sound. I would really suggest going and looking at Dutch Fanfare Orchest. F-A-N-F-A-R-E-O-R-K-E-S-T. Um, the, yeah, and that's kind of the... The okay, so that, that's kind of the the flugelhorn centric equivalent of the British brass band, except with a section of saxophones. Uh, flugel is kind of a mezzo soprano, high alto voice relative to B flat trumpet. Relative to it, maybe, but they are exactly the same pitch. So it it's just, it's a different family. It'd be kind of like saying the. Um, um, what, what's a good example here? The alto saxophone. Well, it's the same pitch as the B flat clarinet. Um, so therefore, it yeah, it's an alto voice to the B flat clarinet. But what's the actual range difference between the two? Uh, half a step. The alto saxophone can go half a step lower than the B flat clarinet. But they are just radically different instruments. Conical bore versus cylindrical bore. So. The idea of thinking of flugels as alto trumpets is really a misnomer. It's done all the time, though, in scoring uh, because they think that, you know, the flugelhorn can just, you know, add a little bit more weight to the bottom, but meh. It, but anyway, so uh, back to our, our VPREC score here. Um, so... Viprecht has this section of tubas. Um, interestingly, the one instrument he does not have in there is contrabass tuba. This can give us some kind of idea about when it was because contrabass tuba really hadn't become a thing yet. Um, uh, sorry, lost my train of thought there. Uh, contrabass tuba doesn't become really a, a thing until Richard Wagner and uh, the Ring of the Nibelungs, where he absolutely requires a, a giant... Uh, uh, most players would use a, a large B-flat contrabass tuba, though you, uh, there's no reason you couldn't use a, a C contrabass tuba either. Just tradition there. Um, <clears throat> but uh, a lot of this stuff then... You know, with, so with Vprec, he's got his family of tubas, which this guy named Adolf Sax steals and says, I'm going to put my own valve on him and we'll call him Sax horns. And not give Vprec credit because nobody likes the Germans. Or, you know, the Germans say nobody likes the French. And so we've got two countries that don't like each other and they steal each other's ideas. It's fantastic. Leads us to World War One, then World War Two great maybe they were fought over tuba patents but who knows oh right historians but anyway so typically in the orchestra the tuba is the only instrument to have a single player on that um in that entire family of instruments so we don't see this in any other um, instrument. So we got a section of horns. We got a section of trumpets and trombones. We have a tuba. And the tuba has no brethren with it. Except very rarely. There are a few handful of pieces where you'll get more than one tuba. Um, and we'll see this uh, starting really with Richard Strauss. We'll have two tubas come in. And usually they're two tubas of the same pitch. Typically two bass tubas, uh, though sometimes it's two contrabass tubas. Uh, no, they aren't trumpets, I agree. I'd never call a flugel a trumpet. I just wouldn't call them soprano without qualification either. Um, this, this gets to the idea that flugelhorns can't play high. And because of how flugelhorns are taught and used in this country, a lot of people believe that. But as I was talking earlier about that Dutch fanfare orchest, go listen to them because their flugelhorns make no bones about going and playing all the way up to the top C above the staff. It's just, that's what they do. You know, 
they're treating the flugelhorns exactly like you would treat clarinets in a regular wind band. So they very much are sopranos. Um, and occasionally you'll even see the uh, sopranino flugelhorn, or the piccolo flugelhorn in E flat, pitched a, a fourth above that. And that's really the highest uh, tuba that ever really got a lot of use. There is one smaller uh, B flat piccolo flugelhorn, um, or a lot of times you see it as a, a piccolo sax horn. Uh, Hector Berlioz used this in the very final um, march of his Te Deum. Um, with the, the Te Deum, that last final march is only to be played if there's a king or emperor present in the audience. Otherwise, you don't play that one. So nobody plays that one. And so you just kind of forget about the, uh, the piccolo flugelhorn part. All right, so keep the questions coming. Uh, I will do my best to answer them as best as possible. And I guess Bill never came back after his time out. Oh, well. Um, so, yeah. Um, go, I think uh, I will really go and then I guess talk about the, the one voice that we haven't really talked about tonight is the, the tenor tuba a.k.a. the euphonium. Or if you're in Germany, you call it a baritone. Um, or if you're in France, you call it a, a bass sax horn. Um, oh, yeah, the, 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 the piccolo flugelhorn. It's absolutely fine. It's the same, um, same range as a piccolo trumpet. In fact, the very first piccolo trumpets in B-flat weren't actually piccolo trumpets. They were remarketed piccolo flugelhorns. Go look up a Mahion uh, piccolo trumpet. And lo and behold, you're looking at a piccolo flugelhorn. And you look at it, it's this big, wide, conical taper all through the whole instrument. And they're really sweet-sounding piccolo trumpets. But they're not. They're piccolo flugels. Um... Interestingly, with the Berlioz piece where he called for that instrument, um, at the premiere, we know who the piccolo uh, tr uh, flugelhorn player was, and it was none other than Jean-Baptiste Arban, who wrote the famous uh, Arban Etudes and the Carnival of Venice variations, and something that every brass player, except probably horn players, has sat through and worked out of the Arban book. So he, wa he um, was uh, Berlioz. Yeah, so Mahion was just taking designs from uh, the sax. Such small instruments with conical tubing seem about as weird as a uh, bass horn in E flat. Hey, it works. Is there even a piccolo cornet? <sighs> kind of. I mean, you could make the argument that that piccolo uh, flugelhorn could also be a piccolo cornet. Um to my knowledge, a true cornet pitched uh, an octave above the B-flat cornet has never been made. Um, if tubas have their bells point up to diffuse the sound over the band, flugelhorns have their bell uh, point forward. Are they too small to do that? Um, bell direction has uh, no bearing on what the instrument is. You could have a bell up flugelhorn. In fact, look at early uh, model soprano or contralto sax horns, which are the, the flugelhorns, and you'll see that they're bell up. So it's you. I've got a, a friend who's buy who is going to have a uh, a flugelhorn converted to upright, so he can call it a soprano tuba. But it's not going to really affect the sound one way or the other. Uh, just directionality to the listener. I imagine a piccolo cornet would be near impossible to play in the high range. It depends on the mouthpiece. It really does. The higher the pitch, the more directional the sound. Uh, in some regards, yeah. Um, low pitch, in fact, in all regards. That's that's just an acoustical phenomenon. So you're right, sweeter. Um, 
the lower the pitch, the harder it is to determine where it comes from. Um, and tubas are bell up just because that's the easiest way to build them. You wouldn't want to have a tuba with the bell front because they're just so big. And yes, there are bell front tubas, but they're not going to be super comfortable. Even the, the recording bell the, puts the uh, weight a lot forward. Uh, so you, that's one reason you don't see those in orchestras. Um, so yeah, let's get into uh, tenor tuba, euphonium. This is one of those uh, very odd instruments. It is highly praised by pretty much everybody who ever hears it. It's one of the most technically dexterous of all the brass instruments, and yet, for some reason, it's never gotten a foothold in the orchestra. Aside from a handful of pieces, the tenor tuba or euphonium is kind of an outcast. Um, and I don't know exactly why. A exactly, helicopter, like the, the G contrabass bugles. Um, we have uh, ma a few major works in the orchestral literature that call for a tenor tuba. And note that pretty much any time it is in the orchestra, it is called a tenor tuba, and you don't see it often called a euphonium. So the earliest pieces we have are the works of Strauss. Uh, that's Richard Strauss. So we've got Don Quixote, um, and Don Quixote, believe it or not, was actually originally written for a solo uh, Wagner tuba, but uh, Strauss, upon hearing it at the first rehearsal, hated it so much, he made them switch to a euphonium. Um, I'll get to your question in just a minute, Brent. Um, so, Va so, um, Strauss reviews it in Don Quixote. He reviews it again in Ein Heldenleben and one last time uh, in his little known work, Joseph's Legend, or Legende. I, I, I'm not exactly sure how to pronounce that, even though I did a major research on it. Um, that's a, a very odd piece by Strauss. It's actually a ballet, and it's one of his last really large works. Uh, some fantastic orchestration, and not a great piece, though. And so he's using the tenor tuba euphonium there. And then we get to our British composers. And uh, the most well-known, of course, is um, Holst Planets. And the Planets has just one of these incredibly huge and important uh, tenor tuba so, uh, parts for it. It's about uh, pretty much the whole piece, uh, though it's tacit in a couple movements. I don't think it plays in Venus. And I don't think it plays in Neptune, but I could be wrong. Um, yeah, so, yeah, everybody's pretty much answered, Brent. Yeah, it's, uh, it's either a chimbasso or a contrabass, um, uh, trumpet. So, anyway, uh, Holst is not the only British composer to include a tenor tuba. Uh, Arnold Bax will use it, uh, particularly later in his career. Happy O'Brien, it becomes really popular with him and his orchestral stuff. Uh, that said, Brian is really kind of fringe, and you don't, you know, you have to be really into Brian to know his stuff. Um, I quite like his stuff. Um, in the U.S., the only composer or orchestrally who really takes to it is uh, Roy Harris. And Roy Harris will include uh, uh, what he terms as a baritone in pretty much um, uh, every symphony he wrote. Um, I'd have to look at all of them. He wrote a lot of symphonies, and not all of them are well known. Uh, have you ever heard First Sweet and E Flat with the flugelhorns included? If And if so, do you notice a difference? No, I've never heard it, nor do I want to hear it, because there are no flugelhorn parts in First Sweet and E Flat. Period. End of story. Amen. There are four cornet parts. There are two trumpet parts. That is it. There are three trombone parts, a baritone part, a euphonium part, and a tuba part, and four horn parts. That's the whole brass section. There are no flugelhorn parts. <sighs> Stupid editors. Okay, so the, past that, I'm trying to think what other composers have really 
taken the euphonium and really made it uh, work in the orchestra. Um, Kalevi Aho, the Finnish composer, does a lot with euphonium in his orchestration. Um, I'm trying to think. There's not a lot of, of others, though. And part of this is... Um, oh, well, there, okay. I, I back up because I missed some of the Eastern European guys. Uh, Bartok will use two tenor tubas, euphoniums, in um, his... Uh, what piece is it? Um, it's it's one of Bartok's early pieces, and I cannot think what it is. Let me just... Let's go to the book. Oh, Kosuth. K-O-S-S-U-T-H. Kosuth. So he uses it there. And um, Les Janacek will use it in a couple pieces. Janacek um, it will use two of them in his Sinfonietta and then another one in a really highly demanding virtuosic part in his Capriccio. Is it impractical to score for both uh, contra and bass tubas? I'm assuming so because of the same harmonic series issue raised in your sub-bass instruments video. But curious, absolutely uh, practical. I do it in most of my larger band works. I will have a bass tuba and a contra bass tuba part. Nothing wrong with that. Um, they can do a lot of unison. They can do a lot of octaves. Um, Look at the British Brass Band. The British Brass Band has two E-flat tubas and two B-flat tubas. So they actually have four. And they can, but it's rare, that they split into four-part Divisi. Um, in fact, um, you will find, even in orchestral stuff, parts with um, a bass tuba and a contrabass tuba side by side. Um, the earliest, and this uh, this is a really interesting piece that I discovered during my research for book three, is uh, Camille Sanson. Sanson is one of these characters. I'd love to uh, do a video on how innovative he was. Um, uh, wrote a cantata called The Flood, or Le Deluge. And in that piece, he scores for two E-flat tubas and a B-flat tuba. So three total parts. And um, it, not only that is these parts are low. Like the B-flat tuba part actually ha literally has a pedal B-flat in it. The bottom B-flat on the piano. And it is the first uh, true pedal tone uh, in, uh, as far as I know, the first true pedal tone in the um, tuba literature. Um, so that is um, really interesting. So he's using that. He also, in his first symphony, will use uh, a tenor tuba and a bass tuba. So um, a euphonium and an E flat, and he actually specifically calls for E flat, which uh, is very unusual for French composers. Damien's gone; he's not coming back. Um. So yeah, so we've got a handful of composers throughout, um, starting the very late eighteen hundreds, and. Uh, I'm really wanting to hear a tuba flugel choir with all of them now. Well, I tend to do this in a lot of my pieces. Uh, I will have, uh, particularly in symphonies two and three, there are tuba flugel choirs that I do. And I, I talk about this in the book. And the, the, the chapter in the book on the tuba section is, um, is interesting because I had to split it into three parts. The first part is true tubas, so bass tuba, contra bass tuba, tenor tuba, um, and then then just on the flugelhorn section, and then combine tuba and flugelhorn. And for the tuba flugelhorn combined, uh, I just basically only use excerpts from my own stuff. I didn't know Sasson wrote symphonies. Then again, I only really know Dance Macabre and the Carnival of the Animals. Uh, well, yeah, I mean, there's Symphony Three, the organ symphony. I mean, that's like one of his most popular works. 
Um, Symphony 2, not well known. Symphony 1, a lot more adventurous than people think. In order to, uh, most common to least common, what are the pitches of tubas do you write for? So, okay, when I... It, do I write for? I don't specify which pitch of tuba the player is going to use. Aside from, I mark it as bass tuba or contrabass tuba. Now, there are uh, things that you have to realize with this are um, regional variations. In the U.S., we have a kind of a set standard of what instruments we're going to use. And that's not the same as it's going to be in Germany. And it's not the same as it's going to be in the UK. So in the US, if I'm writing for a professional group and I say contrabass tuba, it's going to be played on a C tuba. And if I write bass tuba, chances are 80% it's going to be played on the F tuba. There are a few players out there who like the E flat, but by and large, the US is C tuba and they use C tuba for as much of the job as they can do, and then only switch to the F when they absolutely have to. If we go to Germany, it's kind of the other way around. F tuba is the default for everything. Uh, e flat tuba pretty much doesn't exist there. Uh, C tuba doesn't exist in Germany either. It's only F and B flat. So I, if I'm writing for a German group, there's no C tuba. In the UK, they try and do everything with an E flat tuba. If they have to go to a um, larger instrument, they will probably go to a big B flat tuba. So they use E flat, B flat. Germans use F, B flat. Americans use F, C. The French um, use F and C too. Um, I'm trying to think. You're, uh, the Russians use F. I'm sorry, the Russians use B flat. They don't even acknowledge the F tuba anymore. Mm, by, by and large. So I don't write uh, to say that you need to play this on a B flat tuba. You need to play this on a C tuba. I'd say contrabass or bass, and the player will know what instrument they have. They'll use for that. Now, that's only if you're writing for professional groups. If you're writing for student groups, um, in the U.S., student groups are uh, always B-flat tubas. Um, and I do not know of a single exception to that rule. U.S., it's B-flat tuba for all student groups. Uh, in Canada and band, it's almost always B-flat tuba and euphonium. Although I've played with an E-flat tuba and a baritone horn before. In orchestra, I think it's the same as the U.S. Should be about the same as the U.S., yeah. You will encounter E-flat tuba probably a little more in Canada than we do here. Um, E-flat tuba is just really not a thing that we encounter all that often in the U.S. Um, that said, when I was doing the photos, um, you know, my, my friend Doc, Dr. Kleinstuber, who um, I got all the photos uh, with, uh, he actually, his favorite instrument to play is the E-flat tuba. So he he likes the E-flat tuba. That said, it's one he personally built. Um, so, uh, you know, I'm sure there's a little bias there that he built the instrument he plays on. Yeah, never encountered a tuba that wasn't B-flat in school groups. Yeah, um, I, have done, I have twice in my career. So one time... Uh, Years ago, I was actually um, substitute teaching for a band, and I, uh, well, it was actually kind of an interesting story. I came in as a, just a general sub, and I went to the band room, and nobody knew that I was a band guy, and I could actually conduct. So I, I actually conduct, in as a substitute teacher, an entire rehearsal, and the kids are like, man, you're better than our regular band director. Anyway, I was talking with one of the tuba players. There was a part where it said to play it 8BA. And they were thinking, 8BA? I mean, up? No, it means down. And like, oh. So I had whoever, you know, the uh, fingering, it was a low E flat. And the fingering is one and four. So I'm telling, as a sub teacher, uh, the fingerings. Um, 
But he said, no, I'm using an E-flat tuba. I said, I'm not even going to try and tell you what the fingerings are. I'm sorry, I'm using a C tuba. So one of the kids actually owned his own C tuba. He was a really uh, dedicated player. Uh, the other time um, uh, I have encountered it is here in my, my hometown. Uh, when I, w I was band director here for about a year. And lo and behold, the high school had somehow bought a beautiful Miraphone F tuba. And it's like, this is like the best tuba you have here at the school um why is this not being used all right it's an f the kids don't know how to play it well one of the tuba players also plays bass trombone it's kind of an f let's try it he couldn't get the hang of it so he never used it i i wish i could have gotten to explore that instrument a little bit more one of the tuba players in the community band i'm in uses his c tuba because he's a retired orchestral tuba player yeah so orchestral tuba players default to C. I mean, I, like I said, 90% of what they do is going to be on C tuba. Now here's where I take a little bit of umbrage with uh, tuba players. And that a lot of times you will find that tuba players don't respect which instrument the composer wanted. And they're... Uh, Carl, uh, Dr. Kleinstuber refers to these as tuba jocks. In that they will try and man up, basically, and play the biggest tuba possible in order to play the part. So you could see somebody playing something delicate like Brahms Second Symphony on a giant contrabass tuba. When the instrument Brahms knew was very, very small. I mean, it probably only had a bell this big. Um, whereas, you know, orchestral tuba players are now playing with bells about this big. 20, 18 to 20 inches is a big tuba bell. Whereas Brahms probably knew an instrument maybe with a 10 to 12 inch bell. Uh, so these uh, tuba jocks want to make the biggest and loudest sound possible. And... Partly because of that, the trombone players have now bumped up in playing larger instruments, which means the trumpet players have to play louder, which means the whole orchestra gets to play louder. If the tuba jocks would just back off a little bit, use the smaller instrument, the woodwind players would have a fighting chance. And, uh, you know, you would actually hear a little bit of tone color. This gets me into one of my, my biggest problems um with band oh okay let's get Pugolo's um question do you notice any timbre differences between the b flat tuba and the c tuba and the e flat tuba and the f um you will notice more timbral differences between two different instruments of different designs than you will between the actual pitch there are so many variations in tuba design. You could go from literally a three quarters instrument, which, you know, maybe a bell this big, to a giant six quarter instrument and still have the same length of tubing. Um, but the, the difference in timbre is going to be remarkable between the two. And it's that's more noticeable than between like B flat and C. Is there a timbral difference between a contrabass tuba and a bass tuba? Ideally, yes. If I'm writing for bass tuba, I want a much more lyrical sound, uh, lighter. Um, if I'm writing for contrabass tuba, I want a much bigger, heavier sound. The uh, best example I can give is the first time I ever heard a bass tuba played um, was a really memorable experience because it just happened to be that I went to a recital by the tuba player Oystein Bodsvik. And a friend of mine said, oh man, you gotta go hear this tuba player. He is out of this world. And it's like, okay, I'll go hear a tuba concert. Why not? And so I sat there and if you've never heard Oystein Bodsvik, holy crap, he's good. Um, like, Seriously, like one of the best tuba players in the world. And he plays everything on an E flat, a small E flat tuba. 
uh, Mirafone, the, the Norwegian star model that he helped design. So everything is on E-flat. And the moment I heard him play his first note, I was like, this is a different tuba sound than I've ever heard before. It sounds like a big euphonium. This is not the big tubby the tuba sound. Boom, boom, boom. Uh, that you typically... Uh, <laughs> yeah, Oishtai makes euphoniums obsolete. What's interesting is I have heard him play a recording, I didn't hear this live, of Kraft's Encounters 2. Encounters 2 is notorious in the tuba literature for including a written C0. That's a C, the octave below the um, piano. Theoretically, on an E-flat tuba, that note should not exist. And I don't know how he played it, but he did. So he's breaking the laws of physics. Um, thoughts on tu um Yeah. Oystein makes him funny, obsolete. Duke can play crazy high. He is the best tuba player, hands down. Um, uh, yeah. Um, if Roger Bobo were still playing, I'm sure he'd give him a run for his money. Thoughts on tuba sizes? Uh, that is up to the player. That is not up to the composer. Um, it, a lot of it has to do with how big the player is. So uh, one of the tuba players I worked with um, is a um, uh, guy in, down in Arlington. He's six foot eight. He can use a big six four tuba and not a problem. But the fact is he also has a three quarters tuba. So he has both. And he actually uses the three quarters when he has to teach lessons in a small practice room. Um... um so yeah, it, it, it that is a player's choice, and that's not something that the composer needs to worry about. In general, I think I think the tuba. Um, if you're playing a contrabass tuba, I don't think you need to go much bigger than five four. Um, I think that um, if you're playing a, a bass tuba, you don't need to go bigger than four four. Pukalo, you're even uh, lower than the range of false tones. My guess what he did is he played a low note and then flutter-tongued to get a resultant pitch that sounded like the um, uh, C0. Why is the first note of the harmonic series called a pedal tone and the regular note of the harmonic series... Uh, regular note is actually the second note of the harmonic series. Why does the nomenclature exist? It seems confusing. It has to do with uh, organ pedals. Uh, so the organ has a series of pedals. It has a whole keyboard for the feet, and those play the lowest note. So the pedal tones of brass instruments are named after the pedals of the organ. Um... The regular uh, note is actually the second note of the harmonic series. Um, that just has to do with physics. Uh, by and large, the the first fundamental pitch was not used. It it was just too unreliable, and there were many players who didn't even think that that note actually could be played. Uh, Berlioz had this problem with trombones in France not thinking that the his pedal notes he wrote in Symphony Fantastique were possible. He showed them. Um, the only group of instrument, of brass instruments that regularly uses the, the quote-unquote pedal tones, and they're not pedal tones, are instruments like the serpent and the ophicline, and they have to use the fundamental pitches. Uh, but the only reason they're able to do that is because they are conical bore. If they're cylindrical bore, the pedal tones are just not going to uh, be effective. And the higher the instrument, the less effective the pedal tones are. Which is why trumpet pedal tones sound like ass. Literally, they sound like donkeys. Okay. Um, so, so, yeah. Oystein is, is the man. And anyways, the hearing kid play the, uh, the bass tuba... The E flat tuba, it's, I just sat back and said, whoa, 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 whoa. Everything I know about the tuba is a lie. It's a flexible, beautiful, lyrical instrument. Uh, do five valve 
tubas work like a bass trombone with fourth valve playing down a fourth and the fifth down playing down a third. F to C and F to C sharp on bass trombone. No. Okay, so here's how the five valve tuba works. So first valve is a whole step, like normal. Second valve is a half step. Third valve is a step and a half or a minor third. Fourth valve is a fourth. Um, the fifth valve is, uh, as Pukula says, it's a flat whole step. And the reason for that is, uh, the reason the fifth valve exists is to get the final half step down to the pedal range. So on a four valve tuba, let's let's take a B flat tuba for example, four valves down, and this is not a compensating piston valve like you see in British brass bands. So just a regular four valve rotary tuba. Four valves down gets you C. And in order it's a pretty sharp C too. So in order to get the B natural half a step lower and then half a step above the fundamental uh, B flat, you need a flat whole step. So it's a little bit longer than the first valve. There are other arrangements of that. It's not universal that, it, that it's a flat whole step. It could be a half step. It could be a, a step and a half. It, so there's variation there. And then there can be a sixth valve as well. The only time you really see a sixth valve is on F tubas. Um, so you'll have your typical four valves here, and then you'll have two up here. One of them is the flat whole step, and the second valve is whatever the player wants it tuned to, basically. Um, I, somebody might um, say something different what the typical sixth valve is, but sixth valves are really uncommon. And the only reason you see those on the um, the F is so that it can get down into the lower notes easier uh, because you do have to play down into the pedal range some on the F tuba. Not so much on the B flat. Okay. Uh, so, uh, yeah. There, there is no standard valve arrangement. Uh, the most I've ever seen is seven valves. At some point, it just gets kind of stupid. I think I know what instrument you're, you're talking about. Um, uh, given the topic of this talk, I should mention that Jim Self had a specially built fluba. Which, yeah, I've seen uh, Jim Self's fluba before. It's it's essentially, I can't remember if he pitched it in F or E flat, but it's a bell facing forward uh, bass tuba. Um, built with um, flugelhorn-like uh, designs. But if you wound it back up, it would be much more like a bass tuba. And so it, you you start splitting hairs. Is it a flugelhorn? Is it a tuba? Yes. It's just, you know, a variation thereof. Um, so the, the only seven valve I know of is actually, I think it's considered a double tuba in that you have your standard set of four valves here, um, um, and they are, you know, just your typical valves here. And then you've got a second set of valves over here, one, two, three, that put the instrument in the key of E. So these valves here are in B flat. These valves here are in E. So you've got two instruments built into one. Um, it's a bit overkill. And... I'm trying to remember who has that tuba. I think it's somebody, um, a tuba professor on the East Coast. I want to say Virginia, but I could be wrong. Um, it reminds me of an 80s hair metal guitar with like three different necks. Hey, that was a six string, a 12 string, string and a bass all put together. That's efficiency right there. When you get more than five valves. So... There is actually a, a long historical precedent of tubas having more than four valves. Um, Adolf Sax was producing instruments with six valves. In fact, the French tuba 
um, was a six valve instrument. You had three here and three here. So your standard, uh, in fact, it actually wasn't standard. It was, so first valve was a whole step. Second valve was a half step. Third valve was a major third. It was a half step lower than what we see today as a minor third. Fourth valve was a fourth. So you put everything down and, um, yeah, so fourth, uh, so fourth valve is a fourth. Fourth valve plus second valve is a f the fourth plus a second. And then fourth valve plus third valve is the fourth plus a, a half step. And then this is four, four, three, two, or four, five, six is a fourth plus a minor third. I think that's right. Uh, hey, Brett, I don't know if this was asked yet, but how come the B-flat tuba isn't used in bands as much outside of middle and high schools? I personally prefer the deeper tone of the B-flat. Um, there's a, a long history of that. It A lot of it co goes back to um, the instruments that were being made. So the B-flat tuba, for a long time, did not have a fourth valve. So most B-flat tubas you found through the 20s, the 30s, the 40s even, uh, probably even getting into some of the 50s, were only three-valve instruments. So this is a limiting factor. Whereas you could get a C instrument with a fourth valve and sometimes a fifth valve. And so players said, well, if I've got to play it, I need this instrument that will be able to play it. And so American orchestral players went and got the C tubas because they could play the notes they needed to play. Um, at some point, the, fifth, the fourth valve obviously gets added to the B flat tuba. It's, it's used, it, you would find fourth valves in Germany and Austria in the Czech Republic, but by and large, these weren't great instruments. These were uh, instruments designed for band playing, um, and they were not up to the uh, orchestral uh, standards that were needed in American orchestras. Um, so the tradition in the United States got built up into, uh, we use the C tuba. And that's because that was the instrument that was preferred. There are some players now who are beginning to look at using the B-flat tubas again, uh, particularly for big German romantic works, uh, Wagner, Bruckner, um, where they just want this massive organ-like sound. Um, the B-flat tuba is less versatile um, than the C, just because it's a little bit bigger. It it. The B-flat tuba, I've heard a lot of tuba players say that it's starting to push the limits of what a human body can actually do. Uh, it's just so big, particularly if you're using a giant six-quarter B-flat, um, which is why the C tuba is just a little bit more agile. Sousaphones are in B-flat tuned school bands, and there's a lot of not seller instruments. Uh, yeah, and sousaphones are always three valve. Uh, in an outside marching situation, fine tuning isn't as important as it is in concert. And wait, yes. So yeah, you guys settled it. Yeah, exactly. So uh, even uh, with British brass bands, uh, we ha you know talk about um, Cecil Forsythe's orchestration talks about the tubas, and he talks about the B flat tuba. And said. Man, it would be great if we had uh, B-flat tubas with a fourth valve. I mean, come on, manufacturers. It, it can't be that hard. The E-flat tubas all have four valves. The tenor tubas all have four valves. Can't we just get a... Uh... Uh, has there ever been a tuba or euphonium built more compact similar to pocket trumpets? Yes, go look up travel tuba. You can find several different versions of the travel tuba, including the tornister tuba. Tornister is meant to be carried on your back like a backpack. Uh, that's B flat. There's the, um, yeah, the bubby, which is a great little name for a tiny little uh, 
F tuba, and they've even made um, uh, travel euphoniums that are, I guess, I think they're uh, tornister tuba shaped, but just tiny. At Alcorn State in Mississippi, the Suzvons had four valves. It was really just kind of unnecessary. That's unusual um, uh, that they had four valve Sousas. It's, uh, my guess is it, it's be more needed for if you're doing, um, um, if you want to use the fourth valve for intonation reasons. So you play four and you get the FC harmonic series. Uh, haven't you said that due to its compact nature, the travel tube is almost a bass horn, or bass cornet, really, is I think what I said. Um, kind of, yeah. It's one of those, I would I would want an instrument in hand to really fully uh, document it and kind of show what its um, bore is, but more or less, it, it really does feel more like a, a bass cornet. Um, so anyway, let's get on to, to scoring for tubas in a band. So we're going to kind of leave orchestra behind. Um, I'm going to tell you kind of what I do. Uh, and it's going to depend on the piece I'm writing. So if I'm writing for a standard ensemble, uh, I it's uh, tuba and euphonium. And typically you don't have to specify what kind of tuba you're writing for. If you're writing for a school band in the United States, it's assumed it's a B-flat contrabass tuba. That said, I like to go ahead and be prescriptive in this matter. So my, my tuba parts will always read contrabass tuba. Just because I'm a pedantic a-hole. Um, my euphonium parts actually will read tenor tuba because a euphonium is just a category of tenor tuba. Um, now, flugel horns are, are interesting. So here, my score order, if I'm doing it, is horn, so I'm just going to look at the brass section. Horns up top, then trumpets, trombones, flugel horn, euphonium, tuba. So the flugel horns go below the trombones in my scores. And that's, that's universal. That has been, I have done that for 15 years. Yeah, the, right at 15 years. Um, and it's just, you know, that's what you do. You've got that, that whole section there. Um, it, dep and it depends on the piece I'm writing, whether I'm going to use a bass tuba and a contrabass tuba. If I'm writing for more of a professional group, yeah, no problem. I'll write bass tuba, contrabass tuba, particularly if I'm writing for a college group or above. Um, and then to balance that out, typically you want two euphoniums, bass tuba, contrabass tuba. That's a very, very nice section. I don't particularly like two euphoniums, two contrabass tubas. That's not quite as balanced. If, so if you have one bass, one contrabass, it's much more balanced. On top of that, if you want to go up to the higher end, I think for that you need two, three, sometimes even four B-flat flugelhorns. If you have that, that's an eight-voice section. Absolutely would be brilliant. Four flugelhorns, um, two tenor tubas, bass tuba, contrabass tuba. And I never score more than two tubas. And this is what I, I was getting to earlier, um, talking about... Um, one of my pet peeves with uh, bands. Too many tuba players in the bands. If you have more than two tuba players in your band, you have too many. Tuba many. That makes sense. They're not bridging the brass to woodwinds in the same way as the horn. And flugel is mellow, but uh, is mellow, but it's still kind of brassy all the way. Yeah. So when I score for flugelhorn, I'm actually scoring for it much more like a, a woodwind instrument. I don't score them as dexterously as I would an upper wind, but very much flugelhorn, I treat much more like a woodwind. And that kind of goes down the line. Euphonium will get treated much more like a woodwind. Tuba, because they are the base of the entire ensemble is kind of our switch hitter there. It can go both ways. 
Um, uh, most Supas I've ever played with was 11. Yeah, that's too many. I don't, yeah. 11 tubas is enough to balance about 300, I would think. Interesting fact, I did play, I've played with 11 tubas before, or 10 or 11, I can't remember. It's been 20 years. Um, this is uh, my, my freshman year of college, maybe my sophomore year. We had a big mass band thing, and I brought out the sarusophone because, I mean, there's 150 people on stage. You're not going to hear a bassoon. You will hear a sarusophone, though. And boy, could you hear it. During one of the rehearsals, the assistant band director came up. I was sitting right at the edge of the stage. And he, he looked at me and said, All we can hear is that goddamned sarusophone. So I could outplay the entire wall of ten tubas. It was a glorious and defining moment of my playing career. Yeah, I'm expecting that when I get to my all-state band. Um... Uh, yeah. Um, are, are there any brass instruments other than the horn that could serve as a bridge? I've heard of serpents and derivative ophicleides have been described as such from time to time. Those could, but um, you're not scoring for serpents and ophicleides. I'm, I don't score for serpents and ophicleides, and I've got an ophicleide. So um, you could, uh, the ophicleide will have a more woodwind-like sound, but... You're not scoring for it. Uh, tubas, yeah. Tr trumpets and trombones, uh, they are kind of your antithesis of woodwinds. Um, but anyway, so yeah, if I'm scoring a large uh, tuba section, in fact, this is, this is, so I've done it a couple different ways. Symphony 2 is three, no, Symphony 2 is two B-flat flugelhorns, Two uh, euphoniums, bass tuba, and contrabass tuba. So it's a group of six. Um, <laughs> I want to learn double reeds and cerus foam would be amazing and devilishly impractical. Yes, it is because you don't. They don't come up very often. Though I had one in my hands last week. So there's that. Uh, we'll get to that here in a minute, uh, Brent. So we'll talk about alto because I'm just about to get to that. Do you ever worry they might confuse band directors by labeling youths at tenor tuba? I agree with you, it's just uh, defies convention. Yes, I do worry about that sometimes. I also need, uh, I want to be true to my artistic vision as well. Um, so, uh, that said, you write tenor tuba, everybody knows what it is. It's a euphonium. And you write tenor tuba in an orchestra, nobody bats an eye. You get a tenor, you get a euphonium player. Uh, but anytime I do that is, um, um, uh, what I do is I always have a preface in the conductor's notes saying that while I use this name, this is the instrument that's intended. Yeah, I always include uh, notes to the conductor to that effect. So that's that. I, I, I don't think calling it a tenor tuba it will present that much of an issue unless you're writing for um, a beginner band. And I think if you're doing it for a beginner band, junior high band, even some high school bands, uh, you might confuse people. Uh, interestingly, when I finished my Euphonium Sonata last month, uh, it, I, I use the word euphonium, so I did not call it a tenor tuba sonata. I call it a euphonium sonata. Um, speaking of which, that should have been premiered like within the last few days. I haven't heard anything. Maybe I'll, uh, I'll talk to the guy who's premiering it. But that would be nice to have a, a to know that he had a premiere of one of your pieces. Uh, anyway, um, so so as I was saying, so Symphony Two is two flugels, two tenor tubas, bass tuba, contrabass tuba. Symphony three is bigger. Uh, I keep the lower voices the same, and then I add a third flugel, and then I add an alto flugel or alto tuba. Fully expecting that instrument to be played on a mellophone. Uh, mellophone is not the perfect solution, uh, but it's close. It's as close as we can get, standard. Um, 
And this gets to uh, the question, where is the alto tuba? And uh, people have kind of wondered this for a long time. Uh, I have an article by Clifford Bevins on, in one of my uh, books talking about where is the alto tuba? Why was this instrument never developed? There are some instruments out there. Uh, the Balkan Althorn, um, the rotary valve, uh, alto instrument is basically a uh, uh, an alto tuba and I've talked about this uh, on several of these live streams before um, essentially what you would want is a scaled up version or scaled down version I should say of uh, a euphonium a four valve compensating system in and I don't know if it would be better to put this instrument in F or in E flat my gut says put it in F, but I think all the players would say put it in E flat. Um, and it's not one of those instruments that you can um, have alternate slides for. Say, oh, I'll just put this slide in, I'm in F. Put this slide in, I'm in E flat. Um, because of the taper of the instrument, you will throw out your tuning. So my gut would say make it in F. But four valve compensating, so you can play all the way down into the pedal range, no issue. You would need to create a, a new custom-made mouthpiece for it. Um, it'd actually probably be something about the size of this um, Ophiclide mouthpiece. This would be about the perfect size for um, an alto tuba with just a, a smaller shank. Uh, maybe not even. I mean, this would be almost perfect it's got the right uh front facing mellophone or the back facing mellophone front facing front facing so the the back facing old, old style is pretty much a thing of the past you know i don't even think i talk about that instrument much in the book if at all isn't the board throughout the piston block cylindrical? Well, yeah, the board throughout any piston block is mostly cylindrical. Occasionally, you will see a step increase, very, very slight between first, second, third, and fourth valves, but the piston block has to be pretty much cylindrical. It seems like the biggest problem with using mellophone is lack of players dedicated to the right ability dedicated to the right mouthpiece for it. Yeah. And so many players want to use uh, their horn mouthpiece, but you do need the actual true mellophone mouthpiece. Um, which, though, I, I would say is probably too small for a, a true alto euphonium, alto flugel. Uh, it's bigger than a, a flugel horn mouthpiece, but it's not substantially. I mean, we're minuscule, minuscule amounts. So... I, and this is one of those instruments that um, I, I have designed in the back of my head, and I don't think it would be terribly difficult to make. This is actually um, something Richard and I talked have talked a lot about. Richard Bobo and I talked a lot about, and actually over the last week, is um, wouldn't it be awesome to get a bunch of the local, uh, or not local, but bunch of the instrument nerds out there like him like me like jared um and i've got a few other friends who'd be into that, that and we just form a company and we say we are going to uh, uh make custom instruments uh, um the, to expand sections you know great bass bassoons and richard subconscious bassoon and these alto euphoniums and just say we're making custom instruments and we're going to fill the market. And I think that would be so much fun. And I think we could actually, you know, find the people to do it. Could flugelhorns fit in tuba ensembles since they're soprano tubas, I think. Since the board dimensions are pretty much proportional to the other tuba. Well, yeah, that, that's one of the whole premises of tonight's talk, Larry, is that... Um, I, I figured you would, Jared. I mean... I, I have ideas. I don't have funding to back up the ideas, but I have ideas. Uh, so like Eppelsheim, but for more practical instruments. No, for less practical instruments. If a contrabassoon had the two bends from vocal uh, 
to the bottom, completely straightened out, would it make it halfway of being an oversized bassoon? Uh, helicopter, I'm not sure what you're saying there. The contrabassoon's bore is just radically different from that of the bassoon. The bassoon's bore is actually a compromise instrument uh, because the tone holes have to be drilled obliquely. Well, they don't have to, they just historically are. And those oblique tone holes in uh, particularly the wing joint and the descending joint of the boot joint are part of what gives the bassoon its um, charming character. Uh, band orchestra instruments have been more or less fixed for way too long. We need new instruments for sure. I um, uh, uh, I totally agree. How do you get less practical than Eppelsheim? Uh, the most practical thing he makes is the metal contrabass clarinet. He, I beg to differ. Oh, I mean, that probably is the most practical, but his bass sax is bar none probably the best out there. Contrabass sax, again great instruments everything he does uh we just need to find someone with a cnc machine and we're set um i think richard's dad has a cnc uh the classical era contrabassoon is straight and ridiculous as is the baroque the baroque era contrabassoon is more ridiculous than the classical what if this hypothetical company produced bassoons with an improved design as i recall the bassoon is a rather undeveloped instrument Funny you should mention that. I literally sketched out the designs for that the other night while laying in bed. So um, what I did is I basically worked out how you could get rid of all the flick keys, get rid of the whisper key, and just have an automatic octave key that, is, that works perfectly well um, that is a quadruple automatic octave key. And... As far as I know, it would work. It would it would mean bassoon players would have to relearn their technique, but I've got the design. Uh, I've got the concept in my head. I've got a little bit of it on paper. I would need to sit down uh, with um, yeah, uh, uh, some more design specs. Absolutely amazing instruments. They're just weird. Pick saxophone, full-size scotch bass. Subcontrabass saxophone. So the the subcontrabass saxophone he made, he made one, and that was at the request of a player um, who's a well-known studio session in L.A. So he's got that instrument. Uh, you know, you pay him enough, he'll make anything. I'd like to see a, a renaissance of smaller wind ensemble writing that could feature some of these new instrument designs. Uh, yeah, and that's kind of the, kind of the thing where Richard and I were talking about is uh, some of the things that we could do with such a company. Would, one of the things we'd really love to do is produce an affordable bass oboe that would not break the budget of a high school or college. Uh, it seems sometimes in band music the funny gets lumped in as a lower section to the horn section. What do you think about that? I think it works surprisingly well in that regard. Uh, the phonium is more flexible down in its low register where it can bolster the horns. Particularly in educational music, uh, horn players don't have a great low range. Uh, and a lot of times they don't have that great low range until they're professionals. Um, and so I think using euphonium as the bass voice of the horn choir is a great, great uh, scoring. Uh, something made out of a hard resin. Probably probably ABS or Delrin. Uh, my guess, uh, most of the stuff we do, we made out of uh, ABS. Uh, there you go. Uh, uh, bass oboe and alto euphonium duet. I mean, I am the guy who wrote a piece for... Um, uh, bass oboe and heckle phone. Okay, helicopter, I never fully answered your question. I got sidetracked. So exactly how different are the boards are um, from bassoons and contrabassoons? 
If uh, okay, so I was talking about how bassoons have the oblique tone holes that go off at angles. Contrabassoons don't have that. Contrabassoons uh, have um, tone holes that are just like on a clarinet. They just go directly into the bore, and that's because you don't have to have any obliques on there. This is one reason that contrabassoons don't have a whisper key. They don't need it. They they were basically birthed with regular octave keys. Um, would you also then consider a more affordable contrabassoon with this simplified key work? I mean, maybe. I mean, it, it's a, Wolf is already um, making a contrabassoon with uh, automatic octave key on it. Not the contraforte, but Wolf actually now produces a, a regular contrabassoon, which is a fascinating design. It won't be affordable, but it, it's there. Uh, the, actually, the instrument that I have in mind... Um, uh, uh, Jared, I'll read that comment in a second. What I actually have in mind is not a, a, a bassoon, but a... Um, a great bass or a semi contrabassoon. So, um, doing doing kind of some um, market research, um, I think an instrument in G, pitched a fourth below the bassoon, would be the the most viable bet there. Uh, that way, you could think about it as in C and uh, figuring it out from there instead of having to think of it in B flat. Uh, I thought about a plastic bass oboe. I did the math and I figured out I could make an upper joint out of a blank oboe body from China with bass clarinet keys. Jared, I, I'm not convinced of that. Um, you, you're, you could get maybe something along the same bore length, um, but... I, I, you, that's the thing about, um, um, uh, oh, uh, conical bore instruments are much harder to design. Uh, there, there's our winner of the book from, uh, last week. Yeah, we kind of got off on a tangent. Uh, we started talking about, uh, alto tuba and that just led us into the whole realm of, um, Producing a new instrument manufacturing company. Uh, G would work with the C fingerings. Remember we mentioned that F recorder fingerings is most akin to the bassoon. Yeah, and the bassoon is already in F. Kind of. So it would make sense to put the next size down in C. Which bassoon players would think of as in G. Um, but anyway. Okay, so um, yeah. Uh, let's get back. Wait. Wait. Titus, I, I'm sorry. I well, I was confusing you with Ethan. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, it's it's late. My my brain's fried. Uh, but let's um let's get back to tubas. Hey, you are a tuba player after all, aren't you? Uh, so yeah. Um, if we have any more uh tuba related questions, I mean we've been going hour and a half now. So I, at this point, it's kind of free for all anyway. Or do you? I kind of want to talk more about the uh, the instrument company that I have in the back of my head. Sounds like that gets more um, more um, thoughts. Just for reference, I am looking at Adler's orchestration book and Stravinsky calls for a flugelhorn in Threni. Yes, so Threni is a weird piece by Stravinsky. It's one of his latter pieces. It's his twelve tone piece. Um. He also calls for basset horn and sarusophone in it. So there you go. That Stravinsky calling for those instruments in this piece. Um, so yeah, it's Threni is weird. Um, but yeah, just from kind of the, the reaction, I think some of you kind of like the idea of maybe forming that instrument company. I kind of like it too. I, man, would it be fun? Uh, you know, 
things uh, to think about uh, that we, you know, the affordable base oboe. Um, yeah, we can do that, Sans. Um, I mean, it doesn't have to be too far um, in the future. Maybe we can do it uh, Sunday if everybody wants to do that. We can just, you know, brainstorm what to do. I mean, I, I've been brainstorming this for quite some time. Um, I, I would be much more in kind of the design. <laughs> um, okay, yeah, there, there's uh, Vincent Ethan. Who who won our drawing uh, last week? Um, yeah, so I've got I've got lots of uh, designs in my head um, that I I think would work, and I, some of them you know would you know be practical. I, I I've heard of uh, a lot of flugelhorns have four vowels. Would there be any value in writing uh, flugel below the staff? Well, you can write down the flugel below the staff to the written F sharp. Perfectly fine all um, any day of the week. Um, I'm not I wouldn't say a, not a lot of flugels have four vowels. Um, prop maybe five percent of them do, and that may be generous. Surprisingly, when I was in college. Uh, the flugels that the university owned were all gets in four valve. Uh, that said, I don't think they really ever used uh, the fourth valve often. Um, I don't know what P word you're talking about. Um, uh, but anyway, um, um, it, it's difficult to um, um, to predict um, the the frequency of the fourth valve in your flugel. Most players will just have three, and none of the big makers are uh, are are producing four valves anymore, except maybe Getson. I asked about the straighten bends because I realized that a semi bassoon built uh, just like a smaller bassoon would have too many bends. Yeah, you wouldn't build a semi-contra on, on contrabassoon uh, proportions. You would just build a, an oversized bassoon. Uh, yeah, I, I don't see a real reason to, um, uh, to build... Uh, uh, semi contra with a lot of bends. Um, oh, practical. Yeah, I don't do practical. Uh, is there ever a slide euphonium? No. Uh, it's physically impossible. You can't have a conical slide. Um, so, uh, you know, you, you just think about the physics of it. You can't have um, two cones moving in and out without having. Um, uh, Uh, some uh, gap in there. Uh, I got the stream. What did I miss? You've missed so far about an hour and a half, Aster. <laughs> but started off talking a lot, a lot about tubas, and now, um, well, uh, we we're, we're trying to, to to form an instrument company. Uh, one design I have is a plastic bass and horn designed as a rental instrument. I could probably rent that out to orchestras for hundred to two hundred per month. And have a constant source of funding. Uh, yeah, I mean that. Uh, building affordable basset horns would be something absolutely that a company would would take. Um, a company in Laporte, Indiana, in the 1920s called Couturier made a trombone that was marketed as having a conical bore. So, if a, a trombone having a conical bore, this is what we would call a dual bore slide. So the the first slide is one length. The next slide in is a different width and then conical through the valve section. Minutely conical, not great. Press what Brent is saying right now about the impossibility. Uh, yeah, uh, Brent. Now, the, it, it, yeah, there is a Brent in the room and that may, will make things confusing if you, you confuse us. Um, 
but yeah, so yeah, the the basically I think the Couturier is just a, a dual bore system with maybe uh, like through the the bend out um, in the hand slide that would be more conical. Um, but yeah, some other things for the company I think would be like uh, contra alto clarinets always to low C or produce ex uh, extensions. Um, alto clarinets to low C. Um, affordable basset horns. You know, I don't, I, I don't, I don't see the reason why we don't have an affordable basset horn. Uh, start developing uh, oboes an octave lower than the English horn and an octave lower than the bass oboe. So a true baritone and a true bass oboe. Why not? Um, you know. Uh, my most recent impractical instrument idea is a super bone, but with keys and a slide instead of valves and a slide. Yeah, that that's definitely going to be impractical. Impractical. Um, you, it's I, you simply don't have a way to do. It. You'd have to have keys on the slide, hand slide itself, and that's just not not happening. All right, sounds like we've got we, we've got some people interested in this idea. Do I play saxophone? Yes. Um, I I I have I own like seven or eight saxes. I can't remember how many I have now. Uh, it would need five bends to keep the height down, so it wouldn't be unwieldy. At least for me, I wouldn't play one that's six six. Boy, I sure would. Man, have an instrument that's six feet six inches tall? That's a visual statement. Um, are there any particular band works uh, you like with exceptional tuba, euphonium, flugel scoring, perhaps? Ah, good, good. Back to actual band scoring. Something I know. Um, the opening of Whole Sweet and E-flat with the octave, euphonium, and tuba is magical. I absolutely love that. I think that is wonderful. Uh, for euphonium stuff, you cannot go wrong with Moslanka Symphonies 5 through 10. Uh, 5 is just, you know, has a great euphonium solo. And the euphonium solo in Moslanka Symphony 10 is heart-wrenching. Uh, partly because, you know, I was working with, uh, with Matthew w when his, his dad died. And it's kind of his, his uh, love song to his father. That comes out wrong, but you know what I mean. Um, as far as tuba scoring, um, you don't... I'm trying to think if there's any great tuba stuff. I kind of like some of the tuba scoring in Johann de May's uh, Lord of the Rings Symphony. He's doing some interesting stuff there, uh, partly because he's writing for Dutch bands. So you'll often see his, he's writing for E-flat or B-flat tubas, and he's using them separately. Um, anything about intermediate-sized flutes like G-treble? i played a few pieces that are too high to be comfortable for flute and too low for piccolo to project nicely. Oh, uh, well, go... Um, uh, watch my videos on those, Sans. Uh, of course, Sans, you probably already have. Um, th that wouldn't, uh, you know, be, uh, out of the realm of possibility. Uh, maybe you would like to have a contra bassoon built like an oversized bassoon. No. Uh, at that point, it's too big. Have you seen old contra bassoons with just one bend? Yes, absolutely. Um, go watch the, the videos from the orchestra, The Age of Enlightenment. The most recent one they put out is the Baroque Contra Bassoon, and that is the original Stainsby Baroque Contra Bassoon that uh, Handel knew. Uh, was Hull's first suite written for E-flat tuba? Um, probably so. Uh, but that said, he it's he there are probably at least two tubas in the section: one E-flat, one B-flat, if not more, uh, when they were writing. And you'll see a lot of times if the parts split in the octaves, it's E flat up top, B flat on bottom. Uh, a lot of that 
it is a result of not knowing at that time if the E-flat tubas are going to have a fourth valve or not. So anytime Hulse goes uh, to below A, right below the staff, um, then um, it, it automatically assumed he wants the B-flat tuba there. Uh, I love the orchestra and age of enlightenment. Yeah, they're great. Their their YouTube videos are fantastic. Uh, I played Maslanka's Testament on tuba, and it basically seemed to be more like an orchestral tuba part. I was unlike uh, most other parts that I played and had way more rest. That's correct. That's that's um, that's David's music. He you are getting treated like an orchestral player when he writes, and you know. Night Sweeter, thanks for joining us. Uh, we'll probably end here pretty soon. Um, so, yeah, Dave, David's music is... I, I went on a kick the last few days, and I, I tried to listen to as many different band symphonies as I could. Um, it just... It, all sorts of composers, all sorts of time periods. And I keep coming back to the fact that... Um... um David's symphonies, to me, are the gold standard symphonies for the wind band. Um, I um, I can't find any symphonies for the wind band that are better than his. Uh, and that, I think, is including things like the Hindemith Symphony in B-flat. Um... What do you think I can do to get better at my sax because I want first chair of my band? Practice. Simple as that. Practice every day. Practice is you can't practice anymore. Then practice some more. Uh, I, uh, Vincent, I, I'll have to look that up later. Um, it, it, in, I'm impractical. Yeah, that sounds about right. What is the range for a tuba? My entrance is coming out now. Forgive me, I'm a string bass player in a concert band and I am interested in educating myself. Okay, so uh, range of the tu tuba. Um, if um, there's not a good answer to that because you know we've got four sizes. Oh, 